Yeah, I yeah, I think it's I, I think it's really beautiful how we are starting to sort of re rehumanize the maker of um, textiles in these different ways. And like, I think uh, Geese Bend is a perfect example where when they when um, I don't know whoever was I think someone with the Smithsonian or something was kind of discovered these quilts. Um, that these women had been making for years, it was kind of the initial reaction was like, oh, they don't even know, like they're just putting together random scraps and they just happen to be making these incredible designs. And it's like, no, these women knew what they were doing. They were powerful artists that like managed to make things with, like with whatever they had, like just like we're talking about where like, all of a sudden having these restraints of I'm only able to work with scraps provides you like so much, so many more opportunities for that. Uh, and so many more opportunities to get creative in a, in a world where they didn't have opportunities for much of anything else. Um, so yeah, I do think that's a really great example. And um, yeah, for, for me, I just, I constantly, one of my favorite um, quilters from the South, a uh, uh, black American quilter from the South was um, Harriet Powers who is a quilter from Georgia. Um, she was born in, she was born enslaved in the 18, late 1800s, eventually um, was able to become a free person. And um, I mean, she was always a free person, but was eventually able to no longer be enslaved. Um, and she made these incredible quilts. And um, like, I think one of them is called the Bible quilt. And there's another one that's called something else. I don't remember the name of it, but um, these quilts are basically, um, they are storytelling quilts. And so she's they're, they're all applique with imagery from the Bible, imagery from astrological events. Um, and it was all, it was her method of telling stories. Um, and I discovered her work of, like within the past few years and it just spoke so deeply to the work that I make myself um, where it is these kind of, these like kind of storytelling devices, these quilts become the storytelling device. And, um, you know, the imagery um, is described through embroidery, it's described through applique. Um, so I do think that that is, um, that's something that I find really, uh, really powerful. And I love now that a lot of these, the quilters of Guise Bend are, um, they have their own Etsy shops now and their shops aren't, it's not just like Quilters of Guise Bend, each individual artist has their own shop, which I think is really important that we are able to match these quilts with a name. And I like, I, anytime I reference one of their quilts, I always try and reference like, oh, this one was from Margaret Ann Petway, or this one was from, you know, like remembering that like, this isn't just this overarching um, you know, concept. It, it, they are individual humans that have created individual works of art based on their individual experiences. Right. Yeah, I, and just to add to that, I think it's, it's so interesting how in the art world, especially there's this difference between, oh, what is art and what is craft? And historically, for whatever reason, textiles have been relegated to craft. But if you look at Black and Indigenous cultures, um, I mean, there's no separation. Their craft is art and their storytelling through their textiles is, is art. And I think that has a lot to do, especially within like Indigenous cultures, it's very matriarchal and like, uh, I mean, women weave in the home, have for centuries. Um, and it's, it's a part of their daily lives, it's, it's their language, like literally in a lot of different languages in South America, I mean, thread means, like the translation means language. Um, it's their currency, it's, it's their way of life. Um, and it hurts me to go to a lot of museums and look at like the native collections and like to see this art and it's all like unnamed. Like these artists are never given credit. And it saddens me. And I think that there needs to be more acknowledgement, especially within the textile community and what's happening and historically, like even if you look at like the fiber art movement of like the 50s, 60s and 70s, I mean, some of my favorite textile artists like Sheila Hicks, Annie Albers, Lenore Tawney, I mean, they were all influenced by indigenous art. And it's not really credited and it's not really acknowledged. And I think that, um, I think that we, there's like this reckoning that needs to happen, you know? There needs to be this acknowledgement that these traditional techniques have been practiced for thousands of years 
and they're being, you know, threatened of, you know, due to climate, due to, you know, war, or, you know, um, so many different circumstances are coming into play where these traditions might be lost. Um, so I, I hope that there's more acknowledgement. I hope that there's more preservation of these crafts. Um, but uh, yeah, women, women in making textiles have gone hand in hand since the beginning, you know, of humans wearing clothing. So, um, like I said, like in my work, I'm hoping to kind of elevate that, that, you know, that like for people to look at textiles in a different way, that they are art, that they're not just this craft or that's low craft. This is like, this is high craft. This is art um, yeah. that really should not be dismissed or taken for granted. And um, yeah, it's interesting to just like go through history and look at this and discover it. And it's, um, as practicing artists today, oh. like what, what can we do to change those perceptions? And it's one of the reasons I'm so excited by both of your, uh, your work, your bodies of work, because I feel like in some ways it lives within um, sort of this intersection, this crossroads of you know, sustainability and climate change, which is so, so important and so at the forefront of everyone's minds right now, but also with, so I used, you used the word reckoning and I think that that's really correct. We are also um, at the precipice of a real sort of reckoning and, and I, I hope having a conversation within the art world about in some ways like decolonizing our imagination, right? Like, you know, taking some of these systemic, um, you know, narratives out of the art world, which has been traditionally really you know, driven by the patriarchy and driven by a lot of colonialist ideas about what is and is not valuable art. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, I personally am excited by and I hope to see much more of, you know, in the future, a, a real sort of challenge to that.